Most people have probably heard the story about how Galileo proved that the Earth orbits around the sun, and in response, the superstitious church condemned and imprisoned poor, noble Galileo because he dared use science to defy them. But the trouble is, that version of events is actually more fiction than fact. Today, we're going to look at four myths about Galileo and the church. First off, let's talk about the idea that Galileo proved that the Earth orbited around the sun. George Bernard Shaw writes that Galileo was a martyr and his persecutors incorrigible ignoramuses, which you gotta love anyone who says incorrigible and ignoramuses. Uh, at the time, the dominant view was Aristotle's, which held that the Earth was the center of the cosmos and the sun and everything else revolved around it. The idea that the Earth orbits around the Sun wasn't a new one either. A few decades before Galileo was born, Copernicus had revived an ancient Pythagorean idea that the Earth orbits the Sun. Both models were able to accurately predict the movements of the planets, but Copernicus basically made the case, this is a simpler explanation uh, if we can make it work. I think it's also important to note that these guys were working from what was observable by looking up at the night sky. But it was commonly thought that there was better evidence for Aristotle's view than Copernicus's. One of the arguments against Copernicanism that I think is most understandable to the average person today is that the Earth doesn't feel like it's moving. It especially doesn't feel like it's moving at more than a thousand miles an hour. And why, when you throw something straight up in the air, does it come straight back down if we're spinning that fast? In Galileo's day, the rules of physics weren't yet understood that could explain why. So, believing Copernicus's theory meant ignoring what every person knows from personal experience. Copernicus himself described his views as well-nigh contrary to common sense. One major thing that changed between the time of Copernicus and the time of Galileo was the invention of the telescope, which started poking some holes in parts of Aristotle's conception of the universe. Aristotle had believed that the heavens were perfect. All the heavenly bodies were perfect spheres that moved in perfect circles. But Galileo observed that the moon wasn't perfect. It appeared to have mountains and craters just like the earth. And both Galileo and the Jesuits observed that the sun had bright and dark spots. The telescope also introduced new facts into the conversation. For example, that Venus had phases like the moon, which could be explained by it orbiting the sun. But this didn't make the Copernican model the obvious rational choice. Certain astronomical observations did support Copernicanism, but others appeared to refute it. One major problem with the Copernican model was that if the Earth was moving, you'd expect to see parallax in the stars. Parallax is the visual effect of a closer object appearing to move more quickly than a distant object when you move from side to side. If the Earth was orbiting the Sun and moving vast distances, you'd expect to see parallax in the objects in the night sky, and you didn't. The tricky thing that they didn't realize at the time is that astronomical distances are so huge that parallax is tiny. Parallax wasn't successfully measured until 1832, 200 years after Galileo. The other thing is that some of Galileo's arguments for Copernicanism were wrong. For example, he argued that the tides were caused by the Earth's movement. It wasn't until Newton proposed the law of gravity 45 years after Galileo's death that the tides were connected to the moon. We know today that the broad strokes of what Galileo was arguing was right, but the people who opposed him at the time weren't ignoramuses. Uh, there were really logical objections. Myth number two is that people in Galileo's day didn't like the idea that the Earth wasn't at the center because it meant that humans weren't at the center of the universe. Basically, God made creation centered on humans, people are the pinnacle of creation, and that moving the Earth out of the center was a demotion and offended the sensibilities of the church at the time. In the words of James Newman, it is easy for us to see that a moving Earth and sun-centered universe gravely subverted Christian theology. If man's abode was not at the center of things, how could he be king? But that reveals a fundamental misunderstanding of the worldview at the time. According to Aristotle's model, the further 
out from the center you got, the more perfect things were. The heavens were completely perfect. Earth was corrupt. And then according to Dante's Inferno, which was written with this idea, the lowest pit of hell was the very center of the earth. So Copernicus's revised view of things was actually a promotion for humans. In reading through a huge amount of Galileo's letters, depositions by the Inquisition, and correspondence about Galileo, never once was this voiced as a criticism, and Galileo didn't ever feel the need to defend it. In fact, he talked about how delighted he was that humanity would be moving out of the center because it was a promotion. The problem some people saw with Copernicanism was that there were passages of scripture that talked about the sun's movement. Not everyone in the church saw that as a problem. There were plenty of other parts of scripture that were obviously communicating things as they would be perceived um, and not as a literal fact. Um, or think, thinking literarily, for example, uh, verses that talk about God's hands or feet, they don't mean that he has literal hands and feet. And that's a case that Galileo made in defense of Copernicanism. But the Protestant Reformation was in full swing, and some in the Catholic Church were a bit prickly about people reinterpreting scripture on their own. Galileo's case basically amounted to, I'm not saying scripture is wrong, I'm just saying the church is reading it wrong. Not the most popular argument. Third, the myth that Galileo was viewed as a threat by the church. Carl Sagan says, many felt that Copernicus and Galileo were up to no good and erosive of the social order. Indeed, any challenge from any source to the literal truth of the Bible might have such consequences. We can readily see how science began to make people nervous. But much of Galileo's work was funded by the church. His books were often dedicated to members of the clergy. When he visited Rome, popes took the time to meet with him, one of them weekly for six weeks. One cardinal who would later become Pope Urban VIII was such a big fan of Galileo that he wrote a poem about astronomy in Galileo's honor. If we listen to Galileo himself, the people threatened by his work were other academics who preferred the Aristotelian views of physics and astronomy. These are just some of the academic papers that were written against him as he began to support Copernicanism. In a letter to the Duchess, Galileo says his writings roused against me no small number of such professors, and that the professors were the ones who had started quoting scripture against him to begin with. On top of that, in 1611, a friend wrote to Galileo saying that malicious and envious persons are meeting regularly and plotting, and that they try to talk a preacher into condemning Galileo from the pulpit. It's also worth mentioning that Galileo was not the most diplomatic in his interactions with other academics. Even separate from Copernicanism, he made himself a lot of enemies and found himself in a lot of controversies with his colleagues, which left them perhaps a little zealous at the idea of embarrassing him. In the same way I've heard about the church's supposed hostility to Galileo, I've repeatedly heard the claim that Copernicus waited until the end of his life to publish his theory because he was scared of how the church would react. But Copernicus was a literal member of the clergy and he wasn't scared of the church. Based on what he himself said, he was scared of looking foolish. Remember how we said that his views seemed to defy common sense? It was actually a cardinal and a bishop who were two friends of his who finally convinced him to publish his work about heliocentrism. And Copernicus dedicated the book to the Pope. There were absolutely church leaders who opposed Galileo. At one point, a Dominican did criticize Galileo in a sermon, but, Afterwards, his superior in the Catholic Church made him apologize to Galileo publicly. So the church was only opposed to Galileo if you ignore all the people in the church who were supporters of Galileo, including cardinals and popes. There seems to be a perception that scientists and academics are always quick to see and acknowledge the errors of their ways. But go look at how scientific innovators are treated by their academic peers before their ideas are proven right. The innovators are often ridiculed and risk having funding and positions withheld. And last but not least, Galileo's harsh treatment at the hands of the Inquisition. Nobody expects 
the Spanish Inquisition. In the words of John Draper, one of the men most responsible for this myth being everywhere, uh, he was then committed to prison, treated with remorseless severity during the remaining 10 years of his life. This is one of the prisons in which Galileo was treated with remorseless severity. Get the comfy chair! And like not in a secret dungeon beneath this house, this house is representative of where he lived when he was summoned by the Inquisition and he lived with his servant. But I'm getting ahead of myself. In 1616, someone wrote a letter to the Inquisition saying, you should look into this Galileo fellow. He's reinterpreting scripture. And the Inquisition's response after reading Galileo's writings was, he should probably be more tactful in the way he says things, but he's not actually saying anything wrong in what he's writing. But Copernicanism was flagged by the part of the Catholic Church responsible for sniffing out potential Protestant ideas like people reinterpreting scripture. So Galileo left the idea alone for most of a decade until his buddy, the poet Cardinal, became Pope. At that point, Galileo clarified things with the newly appointed Pope Urban, who basically said, you can write about Copernicanism as long as you represent both sides of the argument and make it clear that God could have made the universe any way he wanted. So that's what Galileo did. He basically said, there are two sides of the argument. Copernicanism, which has all the best evidence, and then there's the other side of the argument, which is stupid and only held by stupid people. But God could have made the universe any way he wanted. And when he included the Pope's argument that God could have made the universe any way he wanted, he happened to put it in the mouth of the stupid people with the stupid arguments. It's easy to see how the Pope could have taken offense to this, especially after his long and ongoing support of Galileo through his career. And that's to say nothing about the fact that he was in the middle of being criticized, he being the Pope, the Pope was in the middle of being criticized for not being anti-Protestant enough. There were even rumors that he might be removed from office. This was not a good moment to be looking weak. Galileo didn't get into trouble for religious reasons or scientific reasons. He got in trouble for political reasons. If you want evidence for this, you can look at the fact that while Galileo's book was banned, Copernicus's wasn't. Also, there's the fact that Galileo had his book read and approved by the Inquisition before he published it. It was published literally with their seal of approval. And the fact that while Galileo was put under house arrest, uh, it was literally unprecedented for people being tried by the Inquisition to not be imprisoned. So Galileo, the scientist, was treated better than literally anyone else at the time. He was even allowed to have a servant. In order to prove a point, Galileo was put under house arrest for the remainder of his life. But he wasn't prevented from continuing his studying or writing. In fact, his most important work was written in his final decade. I'm not defending the Pope's abuse of power or trying to make light of house arrest, but Galileo wasn't persecuted for his science. Galileo didn't have proof that the Earth orbited the sun. People weren't offended at the idea that the Earth was no longer at the center of everything. The church wasn't threatened by Galileo or Copernicus. In fact, some of their biggest supporters were bigwigs in the church, and Galileo wrote about Copernicanism with the approval of the Pope and the Inquisition. He just got into trouble for making the Pope, and honestly, a lot of fellow academics sound like idiots. This is not some conspiracy theory I'm pitching here. I read about this first 10 years ago in a book about like Christian myths that I got on a whim, and I literally didn't believe it because I had heard from so many people this myth of Galileo. So then I, I took a deeper dive and went to an agnostic sociologist um, to read about science, and he said the same kinds of things. And then I came across this guy this year, and it was Galileo and history in it too. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do a deeper dive here. And then that's what I did. I went to the primary sources and then got a whole bunch more. And basically, just in the end, have come to the conclusion that this is what pretty much all contemporary historians of science believe about Galileo. Uh, and why, did, how did this all come to become uh, such a prevalent myth? That's a story for another day. But if you subscribe and stick around, we'll get there eventually.